Hello, everyone. So we have now seen um, what heteroscedasticity is and the consequences that it has for our OLS model. Now, heteroscedasticity is where essentially the variance of your error term is no longer a constant, but rather varies with the x variables. Now, what that does immediately to our OLS model is that when your error variance is no longer a constant, the particular expressions that we've been using so far to get the variance and standard error of each of our beta hats is now biased. So it's not an accurate description of the actual uh, variance of our estimate uh, of our beta hats. And when your standard error and variance of these beta hats are biased, uh, all the methods of statistical inference that we've built up so far are no longer valid. So that's the important consequence of heteroscedasticity in the OLS model. So we're now going to learn of a very popular workaround to this problem. And this method is called the heteroscedasticity robust method of inference. So let's see what it is all about. So heteroscedasticity is where the variance of your error term varies with the x values. Now, the challenge here in general is that it is often hard to know the exact nature of this, uh, of this heteroscedasticity, meaning does the variance of the errors increase with the x values or it, does it decrease with the x values? What exactly is this relationship? And that's what we call the form of heteroscedasticity. Now, we generally often don't know beforehand what form this could take. Now, it turns out, Regardless of whatever the form of heteroscedasticity may be, if at all, uh, you know, whether heteroscedasticity exists in, the, in, the, in our data or not, there is a method uh, which helps us construct standard errors in such a way uh, that these, er these standard errors are robust to the problem of heteroscedasticity. So even though we don't know the exact nature of heteroscedasticity, the solution works to address the problem of heteroscedasticity. So, and therefore, the method is called heteroscedasticity uh, robust methods. So you're constructing standard errors, which are robust uh, to this problem of, uh, to, this, to this particular problem. So the only caveat here is that this method is valid in larger samples. So larger the sample size, the better this method works. And the advantage here, the reason for the method's popularity is that it doesn't, you don't need to know beforehand whether your data has a heteroscedasticity problem. As long as you just click a button and ask for robust standard errors, you are, you are predicted from this problem of heteroscedasticity. So let's see uh, how this method works in, in, in practice. So we'll first focus on the case of simple linear regression model with a single regressor. So in such a case, in such a model, we represent heteroscedasticity uh, as variance of u given x is now sigma squared i. The i subscript here tells us that the error variance is no longer a constant, but rather varies for every single unit. So when you have heteroscedasticity, assuming that we are in that world and assuming that the first four assumptions hold, let's go ahead and see how to write an expression for the variance of beta one hat. We're doing that because we know we saw earlier that whenever there's heteroscedasticity, our variance expressions are now biased. So we're going to try and figure out a way to remove, to, to write an expression for that variance such that it helps us overcome this heteroscedasticity problem. So the first step to doing that is to write down beta one hat's expression. So beta one hat can be written in this manner. This just comes from expanding what the uh, beta one hat expression is. Now, from here, we're going to take away the write down the variance expression for beta one hat. Now, uh, I encourage you to spend some time to figure out how we get from beta one hat to this variance of beta one hat. The only uh, the 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 principle in uh, practice there is that suppose you have variance of a times x, where a is a constant. Variance of AX is just given by A squared times variance of X. And using that approach, we can now write the variance of beta one hat using this particular expression. So beta one hat is actually beta one plus a particular term. 
So beta 1 is a constant. Constants don't have variances. So this one drops out when you compute the variance. So variance of beta 1 hat is now just the variance of the second term. Everything except ui here is a constant. So I'm just going to treat, treat, treat that like the a in the variance of ax. So that is a constant. So the only thing which has a variance here is actually ui. So the, this particular constant acts as a, and this ui acts as the x here uh, in parallel to whatever I've written out here. And therefore, variance of beta 1 hat is just uh, sigma of xi minus x bar the whole square times variance of ui, which is nothing but sigma square i divided by SSTX the whole square. So, so whenever there is homoscedasticity, you will just have a sigma square in the numerator there. Uh, and that just collapses to a, a very familiar expression for us uh, that we've seen so far. But because we have heteroscedasticity, we have to uh, stick to this sigma square i notation now. So we've now come up with an expression for variance of beta 1 hat, but we don't know what that sigma square i is because it's the uh, variance of the error term and we don't know what it is in the population. So we're going to make an estimate of that from our sample. So we're going to construct, we're going to replace that sigma square i with something else uh, from our sample, which is a good enough representation of that sigma square i. And what are we going to do? We're going to replace sigma square i with ui hat square. Now ui hat is just your sample residual, right? It's the actual minus predictive value which I can compute after running my OLS regression model. And I can compute that for every single unit, and I can take a square of that. So, and I can compute that from my data, from my sample data. So in place of sigma square i, I'll replace it with ui hat square. And this resulting expression that you see for the variance of beta hat, beta one hat, is now, is now not the actual variance, but rather your best guess of what the variance would be. You are estimating the variance by replacing that sigma square i with ui hat squared. So because you are not computing the actual variance, but rather estimating what it would be, the variance itself becomes an estimate. And therefore, we put a hat on top of b. So what are the changes we do? We replace sigma square i with ui hat squared. And instead of variance of beta 1 hat, we call it variance hat of beta 1 hat. Now, this expression, this v hat, is our estimate of the actual variance. So we say that as your sample size gets larger and larger, this estimated variance will actually converge to the actual variance. And therefore, this is a good enough uh, way of capturing what the variance would be in the presence of heteroscedasticity. And an econometrician called White actually came up with this ex expression and showed how it's a consistent estimator for the actual variance. So, so this is how you would write down the variance uh, expression. So we've seen the formula for the simple linear regression case. We could write something for the multiple linear regression case as well. Uh, and that is given by this particular expression. So once you have this variance, expression. When you just take the square root of that, you get the standard error. We get the estimated standard error of our beta hat coefficients. And these standard errors are actually robust to this heteroscedasticity problem. And we call them the heteroscedasticity robust standard errors, also called as white, Huber, or Aker standard errors, or more simply, just robust standard errors. So the biggest advantage here is that you don't need to know the form of heteroscedasticity. You don't even need to know whether heteroscedasticity is present in the model or not. If you just call for robust standard errors, the errors that you get are automatically robust to any heteroscedasticity that may exist in your model. And most statistical softwares give this to you at just the click of a button or just by adding a single word to your code. And that's all you have to do. So, Let's, uh, and, and once you have your uh, robust standard errors, you just go about constructing the rest of your test statistics, your inferential procedures the same way uh, as you did earlier. 
we can construct a heteroscedasticity, heteroscedasticity robust T statistic. In place of your actual standard error, use the robust standard errors. That's all you have to do. Uh, we can also compute robust F statistics. Uh, the math behind this is, is a little bit more involved, so we're going to avoid, we're going to skip over that. Uh, but we can compute robust F statistics, and such uh, robust statistics are actually called walled statistics. And this uh, information is again given to us very easily in statistical softwares. Uh, so T and F stats are very simple. Um, the one place where it may be a little challenging is when you're doing a Chow test. So a Chow test is where you're trying to see whether you need different regression models for different groups in your data. One version of a Chow test run requires you to run separate regressions. And if you decide to go down that route, uh, it's it's hard to construct a robust Chow statistic uh, if you if you take that path. On the other hand, if you decide to do a Chow test by just using uh, dummy variables and interaction terms for the different groups, uh, in such cases, you can construct robust uh, Chow statistics. So that's just something to keep in mind uh, as you as you go about doing different kinds of uh, hypothesis testing. So we'll just uh, very quickly review a couple of examples and see how the actual, the normal standard errors differ from the robust standard errors. Uh, and this uh, difference actually varies by context. So here's an example where we're looking at log of wages uh, and how that depends on the marital status and the gender of the person, their experience in education and tenure. Now the terms in uh, the numbers in all the curly brackets are your OLS standard errors. The numbers in the square brackets are robust standard errors. So you see that the difference between the original standard errors and the robust standard errors is not very large. Uh, and it, in this case, it doesn't change the statistical significance of any of our covariates uh, in this particular example. So usually robust standard errors can be larger, I and mean, they can be larger or smaller than the usual standard errors. So in this example, they're particularly tad, just a, a little bit larger. Uh, here's another example where we're looking at whether the cumulative uh, GPA of a student depends on their SAT score, high school rank, uh, our, our study, their gender and race. So similarly, all the terms in the curly brackets are usual standard errors. Uh, these are robust standard errors in the square brackets. Uh, here again, there's not much difference between the two. Uh, the only case here is that for the race dummies on black and white, uh, you see that the robust standard errors are actually a little bit smaller. So in practice, uh, this, this again, uh, robust standard errors may be larger or smaller than the usual ones. We generally tend to see robust standard errors that are a little bit larger. Um, here again, in this example, there's no change in statistical significance of any covariate. If we, uh, so individual t-tests just work in the same way um, with robust standard errors. You just have to swap the usual standard errors for robust ones and your t-tests work in the same way. Suppose we want to test multiple uh, uh, exclusion restrictions. So suppose we want to test that race doesn't have any effect on cumulative GPA. Then we're going to test for joint significance of these two dummies, black and white, whether a person uh, belongs to that race, one of those races. So our null hypothesis is that the coefficient on black and the coefficient on the white dummies are both zero. So if we could just use uh, an F statistic, uh, F test by using the R square notation. So we have the R square of the unrestricted and the restricted models given to us. And then we can just go ahead and compute the F stat for that. That turns out to be about 0.68. So it's a very reasonably small uh, F uh, value. So we're going to, we don't have any evidence to reject the null. Now, if we were to compute our walled statistic or the F statistic using the robust standard errors, uh, again, you can get that from any software. We're not going to go over the econometric or the math, math, mathematical expressions there. Um, turns out the robust F statistic is 0.75, which is also a small value. So there's not much 
you know, difference between uh, using the usual ones and the robust uh, statistic here. In both cases, uh, we don't reject the null. There's no, there's not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So, so this is a this is uh, the way in which we use robust standard errors to get over the problem of heteroscedasticity, and it's an incredibly powerful and popular tool and very very easy to implement. So, that brings this video to a close. Uh, in the next video, we'll, we'll go over, uh, we'll learn about how to identify the presence of heteroscedasticity in our data. So let's see you there.